thank Pat for inviting me to do this. It's great. I love, I love to get in front of people and make work. Um, so I, I recognize a fair amount of faces, and hopefully I get to like talk to each one of you at some point today. Um, over the last uh, five or six years, my work has really shifted from predominantly spending time on the wheel or putting it together to predominantly spending time decorating. And um, you can see from the, from the pots over here that just about everything now has, I've been decorating or painting. And it's moving from, from easy, easily decorated stuff to more complicated as I try to like spend more time and more time on that aspect. <laughs> um, so today what I thought I would do is I'd throw, I'd throw a few things that, um, that I do have to put together or that do take this, this next step. Um, and I'm open for suggestions if you guys have things that you want to see me do. I'm, I'm happy to, to try to accommodate any of those. I know some of you see my work for a few years. I have a pretty good idea of the things I make. Is there any, any, anything people want to see specifically to, today, tomorrow? I, no, I don't have, I don't have like a sort of set, set things that I start the day with. Um, I do, I like to make, I find making cups and mugs to be pretty, pretty, you know, like doesn't take a lot of energy and doesn't take a lot of strength. And, um, and it's a good thing to start with. But I, so I'm gonna do, I'm definitely gonna do some of those. I thought I'd throw like a little salt and pepper too. It's like little guys, I've started making these in the last couple of years. And I usually weigh these out to about less than half a pound of clay, these like little balls. But I'll just. First, the, uh, your drawing or the pottery? I, when I was, the pottery definitely. Well, I guess when I was a kid, I drew a lot too. But um, in, the, in college, I did a lot of printmaking and, and pottery. That's two things I did. I didn't do any painting. I, did, I took some drawing classes because you kind of have to. Uh, but I wasn't really excited about drawing so much. But I did like printmaking quite a bit. And, um, and I just stumbled upon it. I had wanted to draw on pot some of my favorite potters, like Michael Simon or people that had decoration on their pots or used imagery. And so I wanted to do that and trying to figure out how to do it with my glaze took a long time because ash glazes typically, people don't like paint and use ash glazes because they run so much. That makes it difficult. And so I, I, spent, I spent a couple years just sort of like figuring out how to do it. And I still feel like I'm still figuring out how to do it in some ways. So this is, a, this is gonna be a little salt and pepper. I'll do like a little rabbit salt and pepper set. I'm just gonna center this little ball. This is a mixture of, um, of B mix and P10 porcelain. I, really, I'm, I'm mostly using my fingertips to center, so I'm like kind of squeezing with this hand between my thumb and my fingers here and putting down, pushing down on the top. You know what, Ben, I could, use, I, I could use something shorter to sit on. I feel like I'm a little bit too high. Yeah. Or, or bricks to go under the wheel, maybe. So I'm going to just open this up. Put bricks under the wheel. Yeah. yeah. There's a couple, you know, there's a couple bricks over there. That might be a little too short. I usually sit on like a five gallon bucket at Guilford, so that's like where I'm most comfortable. <laughs> so now why don't you go off the hump for something that way, or do you usually throw off the hump? Uh, I don't, I, I throw some things off the hump, but I don't throw these little salt and pepper shakers off the hump. Uh, I don't want to trim them at all. I'm just going to sort of like squeeze them and push them around after I've thrown them. And so it works much better for me to throw them 
on something like this. You are allowed to take pictures as long as you're not up in anybody's company. You can take all the pictures you want from your seat. Also, the recordings that we're taking um, will be put on the RCP channel as well as on YouTube. They will be edited, but I'm going to ask for an unedited copy just to have them. So this is going to be, looks like it's going to be on the small side. Maybe I'll add a little clay in. This is a, I remember learning how to, how to close something up and it being difficult at the beginning and just feeling like I start off with something wide and I try to squeeze it in and then the clay would just start rippling at the top and it was really hard to get the clay to go where I wanted it to in the top. And what, I, what I've come to realize over, over some time is that really I just want to make this opening as small as I can in the top as I'm throwing while it's still thick and really throw the pot from the bottom with the tip of my finger without touching that top at all. And sometimes even like going from the top down, but just keeping that area closed at the top. So I'm close this up. This is pretty small. I might throw, this is my, this is my warm up. So I'll just smooth over that. So yeah, so I mix this bee mix and porcelain together. And I found that I really like the whiteness of the porcelain, uh, but it would, if I just use porcelain, it melts a little bit too much with my glaze or interacts with my glaze to, and, and my glaze pools a little bit too easily. And, uh, and I don't want it to do that on like the face of a fox or the beak of a bird, which it often does. So you use glazes to do, do your paint? I paint, no, I use just oxide washes to paint a black and, a, and an iron. And I'll do this tomorrow, I'll actually decorate. I'll decorate something small for you guys and I'll give you a sheet. Or maybe I'll just send a, a, a copy to Pat and she can email it out or I'll, I'll bring some to a hope. And, um, and then I spray the glaze on top. So that glaze though wants to, wants to pool up. So I've got to get it really thin on, the, on certain areas of the decoration. Is it just the high silica content? Yeah, I think it's the high silica content is just encouraging that glass formation. And it's a little bit, and it might be that, um, it's like that surface is, is less porous and so that glaze just sits right on the top. It was great when I just wanted to like run the rivulets. That porcelain was really good for that. I've got these wooden bats and I love these. They, the one problem with them is that they will, uh, they'll grow mold and start to stink if you leave them in a damp closet for too long. But they're really nice. I've had them for years. Like they're, po they're plywood, they're Baltic birch plywood and so they're marine grade plywood and I had students they sell them at Bailey Pottery Supply but I had th three students doing thesis this year and they needed some bats and we were like looking at options and it was going to be expensive for them to go and buy bats so I found a place over near Burlington that had Baltic birch plywood you could buy a sheet of it for like 80 bucks or something and so they got a bunch of bats from I can't, if you looked, if you looked up Baltic birch plywood, okay. there's some place sells it. And so they just cut them. And the other, the other trick I have, so it's got one hole that's large and one hole that's small. In that large hole, I've got maybe a metric bolt in there and it's a little bit larger than the standard or vice versa. And so I have like two different bolts on my two different pens. And one, and they both fit really tight so that there's no shifting of the bats. And I forgot to, I was gonna take them out and bring them, but I forgot to. You can also do that with the plastic ones, although it, it can be a little harder. The wood tends to give more. You probably have to sand those down quite often, or? I just sanded them down for the first time. And some of these I've had for over 10 years, maybe even longer than that but I just sanded them down for the first time, some of them this fall. And um, 
I don't know about, I sort of like a mixed result. Some of them are now, they're not quite as flat. And so when, if I open something up really wide, it can, it can, it can change that outer edge. But you do, I'll leave pots on them for like a week. Like leave like a platter on it for a week in my damp closet and they suck out a little bit of moisture so that things dry pretty evenly. So it'll suck moisture out and then, and then I'll take it off, but then it'll, sometimes some of the wood fiber will come off. Some. All right, that's a better size. I'm gonna have like, this is gonna be my salt and peppers, like mommy and baby set for Mother's Day. <laughs> So I'll scoop under there a little bit. I have the, all these things that, I, that I've done with my pots for a long time because I was using ash glazes and I was getting them to run and move. And one of those things is this, a lot of times it's like a little foot down here that I use to catch, to catch glaze as it runs down the side. And those things I don't really need anymore because I don't put the glaze on that heavily. It doesn't run at all like that when I'm working anymore, but I still have these sort of remnants of things I've learned over a long time to do to the pots to keep the, the glaze on them. Have any of you guys used ash glazes? Does Pat let you fire them here? She say no. <laughs> this recipe I read about uh, this glaze when I was in college by Richard Arney up in New York in like 96 he did an article in or 95 or 4 did an article in Ceramics Monthly and he published this glaze recipe for, for frasca ash it's like 50% wood ash and then it's got um, and then it's got some silica in it and some ball clay and some more flux some some whiting and some feldspar in it. So it's very fluid glaze. And we had it mixed up at Guilford at one point and it just, there was so many pots that stuck to the shelf. It's like, it's not a great, it's not a great glaze for dipping. It's much better for spraying. So you can put it on heavy in some areas. Let me take that. So these are my little salt and pepper shakers. And um, so right now they're just, they're just trapped air in there. They dried out maybe a tiny bit more than I'd like them to be. They're not, they're no longer tacky certainly. And so I'm gonna start shaping them into little rabbits. And, um, and I feel like you guys should be like right here on top of me watching this process. Uh, but I'll try, to, I'll try to do it in a way that you can see. So the first thing I'm gonna do is get the back of the rabbit. Kind of like think about his back haunches coming back towards the tail. And so I'm gonna squeeze that clay and kind of force it up, little tail area. And then I'll grab the front here and kind of pull that in. So I'm gonna kind of have these legs, the, the, his hind legs area, and just start squeezing this into like towards the chest on the front of the body. And when I do the birds, I just kind of like grab that clay and kind of squeeze it up and cut this off down here and start forcing that clay up. And I've never done one this small, so this will be, this will be interesting to see, this little baby. Mother's Day set. So squeeze that. <laughs> and then a lot of times I'll come in and just define, start to define what I consider to be that like back, back of the rabbit. All right. So I've got the I've got the body sort of built and now I'm starting to, the bottom starting to puff out and you can feel the pressure of the air in there. So once I sort of, I squeeze that in and kind of get that into place, then I can poke a hole in the middle of it and let some of that air out. And I'll also push this in because at some point I'm gonna need a stopper in there. And if it's flat against the surface, my stopper is gonna be pushed out slightly. Have you guys, do you guys know that um, that uh, store Aftosa or that online or catalog. What's it called? Aftosa, A-F-T-O-S-A. If you ever need stuff like implements to add to pottery, like 
a pump for soap or a handle over the top or stoppers or pour plugs, things like that. That's a, that's a place that sells just about all of that stuff. And so you can go on there and you can get, you can get stoppers of different sizes. AFT OSA. So, yeah, you can get just about anything from them. So I'm going to make some hind, the hind legs here. And so I'm going to just like roll out a little coil thicker at one end. That's going to be the foot. This will be for the big one. You guys are going to see, I hope to finish this before 4 o'clock today. <laughs> <laughs> little guys. There's these rubber ones that are kind of pointed, and then they go in, down, and back out, and they're hollow from the below. And they're a half inch. They're they're a half inch stopper, and I have a half inch drill bit that I cut the clay with when it's leather hard out of the bottom. And I used to, uh, or the first time I did it, I thought, oh, I've got to cut it bigger than a half inch because it's going to shrink. So I'll make it bigger. You don't need to make it bigger. They're like rubber. They'll fit in there. You just got to jam them in. But if you cut them too big and your stopper doesn't fit tightly, that's worse than them being like a little bit small and hard, hard to get in. So the feet are going to go on the side. Are going to go on the sides like this. But I also, let's see. I'll also just start to take, take some clay away. Some, and sometimes I find... So when I handed, when I passed this around, it was kind of on the, getting a little bit stiff. It didn't feel really that malleable anymore. But once I start working on them, it's like the moisture from the inside migrates to the outside or something, and it they feel a lot softer now. So I start pushing pushing them around. So I'm going to push this up and in, and start to define like what that front of that rabbit's going to be. and where those front arms are going to be, where the back feet. So Charlie, how did you get so interested in all the little animal things? Because all, all your painting from other animals, it must be an animal lover. Well, when I, was in, when I was really young, I was pretty sure I was going to be a vet. And uh, I really liked animals and I had a lot of stuffed animals, <laughs> but I'm dyslexic. What's that? <laughs> that was much later. I had the long hair, but I'm dyslexic, and um, schooling was not was not easy for me. Luckily, I was able to go to a school that had a program for dyslexic students, and uh, and that was really helpful. From I think second grade. I stayed back in first grade, so I, re I went to first grade twice, and then I moved to schools, and it was a great program, but I just, at, I just realized, or I just thought to myself, I, I'm not going to spend that much time in school. Mm -hmm. Like, that's not going to be, it's too hard. So now here, here I am back in school on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so... I decided I wouldn't do that early on as well. But I've always had this love for animals. And, and then when I met my wife, she had a rabbit. I had a golden retriever. And the, they got along well enough after the dogs were acclimated to this rabbit. At first, it was very interested in the rabbit and just sort of like sat by the cage and just watched every, every time it moved. Like the dog was like, <laughs> like oh, the rabbit. Um, but then after a while, it was like, oh, it's just the rabbit. And so the dog and the rabbit were out together. When we were married and in our first house, they were like running around together around the house. And it actually got to the point where the dog would like leave the room when the rabbit ran in. It's like the dog was like, all right, this rabbit's too much. Because <laughs> being a rabbit, you know, is always looking for another furry animal to, <laughs> to fall in love with, say. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
wasn't, but a few weeks before that, when we in the old studio where we were in the, under the library, one night we were doing a pottery class, and this little rabbit comes into the kiln room, and, and he was a tame rabbit, so I took him home. It was a buck rabbit, and so we had him on our sunroom, and then I caught these little kittens, and that rabbit would actually lay down and let the little babies suck on him. Yeah, they, yeah, my, my wife's roommates had uh, cats, and I guess she had a cat for a little while, too. It was, uh, it was an ex-boyfriend and hers cat, so she, but she was taking care of it for a little while. But the, the rabbit loved to come out and run around. He'd, like, chase the cats around, and they would, like, run around under the couch, and the cats would be, like, jumping over the couch and stuff. And then, So this rabbit, this black rabbit named Onyx, just sort of, I, I didn't think of rabbits as being... I was a dog. I grew up with dogs and cats. And so I didn't really, rabbits, I didn't, rabbits were sort of foreign to me. And then having like met this rabbit and spent time with it, it's like, wow, rabbits have a lot of personality. And, uh, and, and they really like to be in, uh, in like a, I don't know, a warren or like a pack. They like to be with other animals. I'm making his little front legs now. So that's, that, so that's one of the places that the rabbits came from, was when Onyx was getting old and he, was, and he passed away. I started putting him on pots. It's a way to like honor him or think of, you know, have him in our life still. And uh, so there was that, those two things. And then I had those Carolina wrens living in my studio. And I'd always been like a bird person. Well, since ninth grade, I took this science class called Birds, where we just learned about birds and watched birds and wrote about birds or like did sort of like scientific like watch birds and see what they do and why they do it and uh and so that's where a lot of a lot of it came from and then that first time I put a rabbit on something I was so nervous about it I just thought what are people going to say about my work like what are people going to say about my pots right it's like this big change are they going to just think it's like silly or funny but People liked it, and uh, and I liked doing them, so I just kept going. And I think that's one. Ben and I were talking about this at lunchtime. It's like, how do you, how do you sort of like find your way, find your style, find your the thing that makes your work your work. And oftentimes it is like maybe those things that you've shied away from a little bit because you thought, well, I don't know what people will think. What will people say? It's different than my other work, but it's something I'm interested in and. Not all of those decisions are good ones, but sometimes you find something that, that is. And an artistic expression which usually uh, illustrations resemble watercolor. Oh yeah. You went off a lot of watercolor. Well, that's funny. My mom was a watercolor artist. And uh, she was pretty good. She got in some big um, like East Coast shows, she got like a blue ribbon in one. She was pretty good. So I watched her, growing up, I watched her paint quite a bit. But I never did it myself. But I feel like almost I could because I saw her do so much mm -hmm. that it wouldn't be that much of a leap for me. And then, so the other influence is that I've got this daughter that we would read stories to every night before she went to bed. And a lot of them were like nighttime stories that involved rabbits. Mm -hmm. And nighttime and other animals, and, uh, and so that's some of the imagery comes, comes from that, from that time, or that just sort of like thinking about that space, that place of being with my daughter and reading. We had this nighttime routine where we read this book, Song of Night, about rabbits getting ready for bed. So a group of rabbits is of one? One rabbit. The story? Yeah, is that? I'm, I'm not familiar. What's that? Is that a Warren? Is it like a okay. from Watership Down? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just like sort of touching up the details of this, the legs and how they come together. There's enough clay down in the corner when I throw this because I can't. It's hard to get all the clay out of that bottom corner when I'm throwing it. So there's enough clay to kind of push around. And I'm just, I'm just like 
pushing this clay and I want to keep those front feet close, close to the body, lots of attachment here so they don't pop off. And these have gone through a change. The first ones I made, I'll say weren't as good, but weren't maybe constructed as well. And I just like learned some things over time. And I, and I feel like that's always the case. It's like the first one I make is the first one and as good as it seems at the time. And a lot of times they seem like, wow, that's like the best. But then over time you realize that eh, there's a lot of problems with it or things that could have been better. And so, um, so that's another thing that draws me to making pots is just the repetition to just be able to get back in the studio and make that form again and explore. And that's sort of like the visit with an old familiar friend where you think, well, maybe I'll change the conversation a little bit this time and, and see where, where that takes me. So now I'm working on his head and rabbits have this like really, they're pretty narrow as they come to the front of their head. The bulk is more in the back of their head. So I'm kind of like squeezing that out. And a lot of times if they're sitting, their head's sunk down pretty low into their body. It doesn't really protrude up very much. And so I'm going to op open the back of this rabbit up, this rabbit's head up, push this clay out. And I want to give myself some areas to attach. So I've got this edge of clay just sort of sticking out. Do you guys see that? I'll do this when I put handles on as well. And because I might get some air pockets in there, usually we'll go back and pop that. So sometimes I have them looking to the side, maybe straight forward. So one thing that when I was down in Atlanta, at first I was playing a lot of ultimate frisbee. Some of you might have heard me say that. I'm a big ultimate frisbee player. And I had, uh, there was another guy who played who was a potter. And he was in his 40s at the time. And uh, he was into his career and he did pretty well. His name was Chris Simon Selly. And he like had stuff in the Sundance catalog. You know, he was like, he was a production potter. And, um, made like art type pottery, but in a production type style where he'd paint the surfaces, but just, it was just sort of like abstract color paintings. And I was asking him advice. It's like, how, you know, what's important? How do you do this? And how do you do that? And, um, and he said to me at one point, he said, you, you have to, your work has to be different from other people's in order for galleries to really want it. It's got to be this thing. And I thought at the time, I kind of took it as, <laughs> as your work's not different enough from other people's, and it probably wasn't at the time, but I kind of took it as an insult in a way, and I don't think he meant it that way at all, but just sort of like, you know, you got to develop your work and get it to be your work, like really your work, and, um, and how do you do that, and what is that path like? And now, I, like from this side of it, I understand what he meant. And, um, you know, when, when I go to the, when I go to the farmer's market, if somebody wants one of my pots, I'm the only one who makes any work like that at all there. And so if they want something, they, I'm the person they've got to come to get it from. And from a, from a business standpoint, that's a good place to be, right? You want like, there's no other option. You can't go to the couple booths over. So I make these little ears, a little bit thicker down on this side. And I love this tool, this call like a pencil tool. And I'll take that and I'll roll it back and forth in here and kind of form, form my ear a little bit. I don't know if there's a quick way to sort of find your own work. I feel like for me, it's been a, like a good 10, 10 year, 12 year journey. And, uh, and I'm still working on it. There's some things I feel like are really mine and other things that I feel like are, are still maybe not quite as digested by me and sort of regurgitated into my voice, but similar to other things I've seen. 
So I'll smear, I'll smear that head or I'll smear that ear down into the head. So then I'm going to go in with the needle tool and I just kind of press this, just kind of where I smeared it in, get that ear. You were concerned where you attached the rabbit's head or the parent ear puppet. Would you go through the bottom? Yeah. And pierce that afterwards to, yeah. to give that void some place for the ear to go? I'll do that and I'll do this other thing in, in the actual ear. So then I take the, the tip of this side and I'll push this down and in to his head so it looks like that ear disappears. And that's another way to just attach those ears on even better. So he's got this little fat rabbit. He's well fed. <laughs> so someone's been asking me to actually just make them some rabbits, yeah. some big rabbits. And then I can take this and go down into that hit, into that cavity. Or do, yeah, I'll just leave that hole in there. And it's so it's down in there, it'll fill with glaze, most likely. So that's one. Oh, and then I, I don't have this, but I usually take a ballpoint pen and I drop the the um, pen back in and I use that for the eyeballs and I like push with that like little circle and you can get different like size ones if you if you get into animals and you need like different shaped eyes and size eyes so that's one you guys see so I'm gonna So again, I'm going to push this in. I'll go through this again. So you can see why if, I'm, if I've got like a bunch of these sets, I can't make a bunch at once. It just, that actually went faster than I thought it would. I've got to do something else now to take up that time. Yeah, my, my, um, I, I certainly wouldn't do this for a couple of days. It would be like a one afternoon thing and that would be it for that. That would be it. That would be it. Yeah. I'm an artist and I just, the thing with pottery is it's sometimes repetitious. And... Yeah, you can, yeah, you just have to sort of, a, if you, if you want to make more pots, you just kind of have to adjust what you make and how you make it. And I could certainly with the drawing and stuff, I could add that in. And I've always thought that I would do this it's like every cycle, I think, oh, okay, I'm going to get to the decorating. I'm not going to leave it for like the last thing. I'm going to do it like in between at night, sitting around with the TV on, decorating some pots. But it typically, it gets to the end and I, I've got to do it at the end. And you can see, I, I'm going to add a little bit of water just right here to soften that up. But mostly I'm just sticking them together because it, the clay is fairly soft and things are just going to stick. This guy's got some big back legs. There's also something about working in front of a group that I feel like I'm showing you this, but it's not necessarily, I'm not in my studio, I'm not like sort of working. I don't see this as going into the kiln and being part of the next group of things, although it may make it to that point. But there's some freedom. There's freedom in, in not feeling precious about it. I want to make something good for you guys, but I don't feel like if I want to make some changes to it, I can do that. And that's what I, that's what I feel like happens at Guilford as well when I'm teaching, that I can, I can make pots over there for st in front of students and I can, I can just try different things or say like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to do this to this. I'd never do this at home, but I'm going to do this here because this is here and home is home. And I can play in a way that I don't feel like I get that much time to do in the studio. 
And that's something about teaching too. And I, and I also have to, I've got to deal with students who are like really struggle with centering, like can't pull a wall. You know, it's like, well, how do you, how do you get somebody to make a three pound pitcher if they can only like, if they can barely make something this large? And so it makes me, it sort of takes me out of my work and my world and makes me sort of problem solve to help that student problem solve. That's a good, I feel like that's a good place to, to go for inspiration. A lot, sometimes I'll bring that stuff back into my studio. I also make these solid for knobs and things at the top of pots. All right, you guys see that? Is it up on the screen? Yeah, I'll make like a, on the top of a jar, make a little rabbit or bird knob. I'll put a needle hole through them. Don't, don't tell Ben or Ben, don't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> Things blow up in the kiln, not because they're, not because they're air pockets, but because they're fired too fast for how much moisture is in them. And, uh, and sometimes there's water that is, is bound up in the clay in a way that you just got to go through that first thousand degrees kind of slow. Do you do a lot of slow fire? Um, I've probably, probably like low for three hours, medium for three hours, and high for about an hour and a half, two hours. So it's, I wouldn't say I fire slow, but if I, but if I uh, do have pots that are wet and like those big platters, when I have those in the kiln, I'll usually extend that and maybe I'll turn on like one element on for like six hours and then start firing slowly. So I definitely think about it. But if it's a bunch of thrown pots, they're usually fine. They usually make it through the process without blowing up. For bisking, yeah. Yeah, I don't, do you guys ever have anything blow up in the gas kiln or like a high fire kiln? Fall apart. Yeah, that's a different, that's a, that's a maker error. <laughs> Sometimes with student work, it's just tough. It's, I don't know if you guys have an air conditioner in here, but man, at Guilford, when the air conditioner's on, it can, take, it can take days for things to dry. And if they're thick, if they're like some of the first hand-built pots, this will happen in the fall. Fall semester, the first thing we do is these big hand-built pots. And some of those can have moisture in them for long, long periods of time. And even though they seem dry on the outside, there's like some bit of moisture on the inside, and they blow up or have pieces pop off. But it used to be, that you used to just hear like, oh, if it blows up, it's because you had an air bubble in it. And I've seen, I've either like heard about or saw a video of, so, or maybe I just heard about this at some place. It was a guy who was loading the kiln, the bis kiln. He just put all the pots in and turned it on high. And if pots blew up, it's like they weren't made well enough. <laughs> so, so, and they just be like, yep, too many air pockets in there. <laughs> Students, students do all the bisque firing at Guilford. I might load a bisque occasionally and run it, but mostly students do it. And this year, where one of my TAs, who's like really experienced and been in there for a long time, she accidentally, when she was giving the demo, or actually I gave the demo, but of loading it, but then I had to go to lunch. And, um, and she was like, all right, I'll just finish it up. So 
she went through the computer program with the students and she put it on cone 10 instead of 010 for the bisque. It's like a bunch of, a bunch of pots came out completely and totally over fire to the point where like useless. Yeah, it's a, it's a learning environment. You know, you're not there to like make production work and, and sell it. So. No, but you know what would happen? We, we used to have kilns with, with no kiln sitter. You just had a, a spy hole and you had to catch them. You had to catch it in time. So he's, he's coming along, or she. Um, and so students would oftentimes not catch it in time in the over bisque. Or defective cones. Or defective cones. Or, and that happens. or you just get somebody who just doesn't understand what they're looking at. In a cone sitter? When you say fail, it failed to melt or failed? And the kiln never shut off? I first came out with those kiln sitter, I can't remember what they called them. No, it's not, no, it was when they first had the digital controllers, but it wasn't the little controller. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that's really hot. How hot is that? Are you sure it wasn't just the kiln shelves? <laughs> yeah. They weren't made out of glaze. That's hot. <laughs> yeah, not made well enough. <laughs> Had some air bubbles in them. So we called the company and they said it was our fault because... You're not supposed to leave the kiln ever, right? <laughs> What um, what kilns what what kind of electric kilns have you guys bought that you felt like were particularly good? We used Scott for a number of years, and we just have bought an L and L. I guess was it last year? I've got a Scott at home, and it's been awesome. I've never changed an element in it. All I do is bisque fire, but I've had it. I've had it for like probably sixteen years firing in it, seventeen years. It might need an element change. We've had our Scott at home for over 20 years. Over 20 years. Yeah. This perfect What's that? The elements are expensive. Yeah. It's tough to change them. Tough to change them. We have an L&L at Guilford after having, we had this other brand. I won't name it because I'm on camera. <laughs> I picked, I was able to pick it up and drive it back to Guilford. And it was, so it was like $900 instead of, I don't know, 1300 So it was a good, good price. And it just, the, the, between the two boxes, there was plastic, um, plastic plugs, and they would melt and fuse together, and then they would die, and like a section would die. And uh, man, that was back when maintenance would actually come and work on that stuff, luckily. <laughs> At Guilford, now they kind of, I don't, they don't really, if I had an electrical problem, they come and work on it. But they used to come and spend hours on that kiln trying to put it back together. I was so glad when I got that L&L. &L. It's like I spend the money and get something good. All right, another ear.
the other two ears. So it sounds like a lot of people want to see me decorate some stuff. So I'll definitely do that tomorrow. And as I was telling somebody, um, I'll probably just do a couple little things because it's, it's, it's like watching paint dry, I feel like, to watch me sit there and paint a pot slow. I spray all, I dip the insides and spray, or pour the insides and spray all the outsides. And um, I don't do that because I think spraying is a particularly fun activity or, or it just, it happens that that's kind of the corner I've worked myself into. Uh, but I don't really, I'm not, if I could do it by pouring glaze, then I would much prefer to pour glaze. It just happens that I can't do what I want to do. We've been, we've gotten some underglazes at Guilford in the last year or two. And I hadn't really used them before. I, I just used, like, mixed my own, but I hadn't used commercial stuff. But now you can get these like commercial reds and oranges and yellows and as well as like blues and browns and things. But that'll come out fairly well at Cone 10. And so students have been using them. What I found, and I've used them a couple of times on my pots too. I had like a, I had a mockingbird or a, not a mockingbird, a, a magpie and I put a marble on it. And so I drew this little, I painted this little marble with underglazes and I put a really thin coat of clear on it like very thin, I could see through it and waxed it and then sprayed the pot. And because it's under glaze, you don't really need a thick, you don't need very much glaze on top of it because it's gonna come out like it's gonna come out, it's just gonna add like a layer of glass. And because it already glasses up a little bit, um, you just don't need, you don't need very much. But it was a great little addition. And, um, and I think that's a good way so students now, like Ray's done some stuff, and I said, oh, if you put the underglaze, or if you put the clear on too thick, then the underglaze can crawl. You can have some problems with that. So I said, like, water it down and put on, like, a really thin coat, and that was a good result. What brand underglaze do you have? What are they? Velvet underglazes by Amico. Amico. You can make those, too. You can make them? Yeah. Uh, nice and yeah. The nice thing about the ones you buy, and I don't, I use ones that I paint on myself, but they'll smear. And those ones that you buy, they must have something in them that, Gum. that yeah, that makes them harden up after you paint them on there and they won't smear. So if you're in a school setting and you got a lot of people touching your pots in and out of the kiln, bis kiln, then you can sort of guarantee that your like decoration won't get on somebody's fingers and off your pot. All right, so there's a, there's a little, the mama and the baby. Yeah. And so I'll put eyes on those. 